Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Dan Gabriel. He is the director of the documentary film Mosul. Now, if you've listened to any of our episodes with our friend Johnny Walker, you'll recognize that Mosul is his hometown. And you'll remember that he had to leave there because it got too dangerous for his family to stay. And in the documentary, Dan gets Iraqis to tell the story of the fight to take Mosul back from Daesh. That's what they call the radicals we call ISIS, except Iraqis don't even want to acknowledge that name. And the people of Mosul who take it back are a mix of Iraqi special forces, small tribal groups, Kurds, Yazidis, Sunnis, Shias, all working together despite their differences to get rid of the scourge of Daesh. This movie is dangerous, it's graphic, it's gritty, it's beautiful. The sound is terrific, the images are stunning. In Pete's words, this is a motherfucker of a documentary, and he is absolutely right. See it on iTunes, there's a link in the show notes. In the meantime, enjoy our guest today, Dan Gabriel. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copa. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Dan Gabriel. I am the executive producer and director of Mosul, and we're on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Scott introduced me to Dan. We actually hit, you know, it's one of those uh, e-friends where we've not met face to face, but we already know a lot about one another. And Dan has put together a hell of a film. It's called Mosul. That's an area actually where I worked, Dan, quite a bit in 2004, 2005. So your movie hit home with me in quite a number of ways. You guys can find his movie at mosul-film.com. And that's for his website. On Twitter, it's film Mosul and on Facebook it's Mosul film if you type in Mosul and film you're gonna find it if you have any trouble with that hit me up you can find it on Instagram it's all over the place it's not hard to find so uh, Dan thank you very much for coming on I'll let Scott kind of open from there this is a great episode because I was lucky enough to watch the film before it even came out thanks to Dan and it is I've watched the film front to back twice solid and I've got two pages of notes on this remarkable film. And Dan and I met in Washington, D.C. at the Vetti Awards, the fourth annual Vettis. And I think it was through Sherman Gilliams with AMVET. And we just kind of hit it off. We started talking about being artists and guys who used to work for the government and telling stories. And it was through that really, I think, uh, just obscure introduction that we we hit it off and then dan read read my book and 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 we've just been talking back and forth about his film and and the importance of sharing these great stories and uh understanding that you know there's so many amazing stories that are are, that are coming out of this war that have to be told and dan was already in post-production ready to launch when we met and since then you know, I, and then Dan and I linked up again when I was in DC. We went to a a, a, a launch gala at Trump International, which was a, a smash success uh, for combat correspondents and journalists. And I think Dan, the question I would have for you right out of the shoot is a question that I get often: is why did you have to make this movie? Well, Scott, I think it's many of the same reasons that you probably wrote Echo and Ramadi, which is you know, you, you did something for your country, you witnessed something, uh, you were moved by it, and, and you felt that you needed to tell beyond the small band of brothers that knew what happened there, uh, the sacrifices and, and, and the importance of, of, the, of what you're involved with. So for me, you know, uh, having been at, in Mosul 2014, I actually got to Fab Merez on the day that it had blown up, uh, although we weren't stationed there. Uh, we were up the road a little bit at the... Uh, Republican National Guard base, but you know, the, the fall of Mosul uh, a decade later, I, th- I think it's just been a very emotional thing for, for veterans that served certainly in Mosul or, or anywhere in Iraq or Afghanistan uh, because it's, it's, it's their time, it's their blood, it's their sacrifice uh, that they've invested in 
in it and and to see you know to see ISIS take this second second largest city in Iraq over was was just a very emotional uh, impactful time. Tell tell everybody listen what the film is about. Yeah, the, I mean the film is really it's an Iraqi story. It's on on a couple levels. Uh, it's an Iraqi story because it's really the story of Iraqi people uniting together to defeat ISIS. And it, we're talking about different sectarian tribes that we all know so well. Uh, in Iraq that, that make up their, their nation, uh, the Sunni, the Shia, the Kurds, the Yazidis, the Christians. It's told through the perspective of a journalist, Ali Mullah, who travels from Baghdad up the Tigris River uh, to Mosul between October 2016 and July 2017. And what we see through his perspective, uh, it, it's kind of like Heart of Darkness or, or Apocalypse Now, uh, as we go up the river and, and further into time, it, it gets stranger and stranger. And the characters that he meets along the way, these are real people, uh, but he, he meets them like along the yellow brick road and he meets these characters that get more and more obscure uh, and have these stranger and stranger stories to tell. Uh, and he's left with, by the end of the journey, by the end of the, the conflict, when the, when the victory is finally declared in July of 2017, he's left with questions about what's the future of Iraq? Uh, what did he really witness? And is, will the unity uh, prevail? beyond ISIS. Yeah, I like that in watching the film, and just so listeners understand, is this is a full-length feature documentary. These are these are real people. This is a real situation that happened. And what's what's interesting too about the ties that in our relationship is a lot of times I was asked a question about the the fall of, of Iraq when ISIS took over in May of 2015 as professional warfighters. And just so people know, Dan Dan worked for um, you know, the CIA, uh, that's, he was in country. Uh, you can talk a little bit more about that, but we're often asking, you know, do you feel regret or sadness that ISIS took over after you left? And my answer is always no, we didn't need a crystal ball to figure out ISIS was going to take over if we didn't leave a presence. And this story, Masul, is a, a, a really a really interesting perspective because initially when I clicked on the film too, I thought I would see Dan in it, but Dan's not in the film. And it's, it's this journalist that, that travels not only in Missoula, but in and around and, and through the journeys of all of the characters that are depicted in the film. And one of the most interesting characters is the female commander of one of the, one of the groups. And the fact that you were able to hone in on her story, I think, both to Pete and I are essential because we're constantly talking about the female voice and the other 50% of the population. And especially in a uh, you know, Arabic culture, you know, an Arab culture that, you know, has a long history of oppression of females to share that story of a woman who's now a commander fighting against ISIS in that country. Why was that some, did, was that something that just happened as you were filming or were, was reported on, or was that something that you really dialed in on to tell her story? Yeah, well, she had this kind of, uh, this kind of growing legacy that developed over, I guess it would be between 2015 uh, through 2017. Uh, Cause as you'll see in the story, she's a, she's a widow two times over. So ISIS killed her first husband, her second husband. I think they might've killed her brother too. Uh, so she's, she's on the war path. She's got a vendetta. She's a very powerful and compelling figure in the film. And, and it's, it's to, to your point, you know, we don't often talk about the other 50% of the population and these kind of war conflicts or, or war stories. But this is a woman who's not only a victim and a widow and a, and a, and a refugee, in a sense, within the war itself, but she's also a, a, she's also a protagonist because she leads these uh, groups of militia, both Sunni and Shia, and she's frankly badass. I mean, she's she's very empowering uh, in terms of a female character. It's it's like if Hollywood were creating a female lead, they would put her in the next Avengers. I mean, that's but that's her in real life. I and mean, there's a really powerful scene. It's kind of funny because she's she's cooking this huge uh, you know pot of chicken stew for probably <laughs> fifty guys or something. She's stirring the pot and she's telling she's she's answering the question of whether she's committed essentially war crimes. Uh, because she's been accused of cutting the heads off dash fighters. She kind of looks up, she looks over to her assistant, she says, did I put salt in this? And then she goes right back to talking to the interviewer and says, no, no, I, I never, I don't cut their heads off. I, I do drag their bodies around, but that's just to show the families that they're dead. And she does it with yeah. a straight face, you know? 
Yeah, that, I, I'm glad you gave that away as like, not a spoiler alert, but I, that was one of my favorite scenes in the film where she's cooking. And I think, doesn't she say something to the effect too? I haven't cooked for my men since my, my husband died. She, at that point, very maternalistic urge to cook for her troops and her family, kind of give back a piece of herself, which was something she grew up doing that she really loved to do. And she was at a point, even at the in the midst of the war, she wants to do this act of kindness, I think, for her for her troops and to, and to cook in the middle of all that as she's boiling over. And she doesn't look like the Marvel uh, superhero. She looks like a mom. She looks like someone's wife. She's very typical and ordinary look, but she has this mystique about her and this, this iconic status amongst those who fight for her against uh, the insurgents and ISIS. It's, it's really remarkable. I'm glad you, you mentioned that. Yeah, I think to some of what you said, I think it's an internal conflict within her as a, as a character, as a, as a person. You know, she, she quote unquote swore off, you know, cooking and being in the kitchen after her husband died and she, she was going to focus on, you know, the, the manly pursuits of killing and being a warrior. But then here she is again with those maternal instincts on display, you know, cooking and, and, and um, and that for her, for her own troops, like they're her, like they're her children and family. You were talking about Merez when it blew up. Are you referring back to 2004? Yeah, it was December. I don't remember what the date was. Maybe a week before Christmas. But that was I had I had flown up from Baghdad to uh, to Mosul on that day, and uh, yeah, that was my welcome to uh, to Mosul. It was like I said, it was down the road from where we were staying, but that was a significant event of the day. So I lived on uh, Camp Diamondback, which is the sister camp to Merez. The whole complex in Arabic is called Lizlani. And that day was, yeah, it was a horrible day. A suicide bomber had walked into the chow hall full of Americans and, and blown himself up inside of there. And Mosul doesn't get the attention of like a place like Ramadi where Scott was or Fallujah that have the big names. But it was sort of the top of the uh, toilet bowl of stuff that came in from Talifar from Syria, a lot of a lot of nefarious activity and very dangerous in terms of how things were. You were there working. You you saw what Mosul looked like in 2004. When you look at what it looks like now, given all of the stuff that everybody's tried to do, the structures are just absolutely ruined there. I was shocked at how how much devastation had happened uh, from ISIS. The all of the destruction of the artifacts and Nineveh and all that stuff aside, just the humanity portion of everything being wrecked, but also compared with the quality of the operators. I mean, I remember training Iraqis and how to shoot, and it was frustrating because just to get them to do basic things, it was impossible. So you have this kind of dichotomy, right, of, of what appear to be very proficient troops you know, when we were there, they would fill their uh, ammo pouches full of foam. Those guys looked like real warriors out there really doing it. Not that they were dressing like warriors. But then you have this wrecked community and humanity and society. Talk a little bit about that, like reflecting back and bringing it to the current time when you see all of that mixed together. For me, it was very troubling. Yeah, well, let me, let's go back to 2004 for a second. So, uh you know, my, my point of reference was the same as yours, and I, I think you're right. Mosul didn't get a lot of the attention that uh, Ramadi or Fallujah had. By the way, I was I was also in in Ramadi in 2004, and I mean I'll tell you, uh, just comparing the two places, if I were going to buy real estate back then, I I would have definitely chosen Mosul because it definitely didn't seem like it was about to, to spin off the axis like it did, uh, as compared to what was going on, you know, southwest of there. But spoiler alert, there's nothing left of Mosul. I mean, it's especially West Mosul. It looks like uh, Stalingrad in, I don't know, 1943 or 44. There's a long way to go there to build that society back into a functioning civil society. The protagonists that we saw in, in the film Mosul, are gonna, they're going to determine the future uh, of the city and, and the, the region and the country. You know, or, and and, and the, the danger looming on the horizon is that you know, we see ISIS 2.0 or we see this, this whole thing just, just pull apart. And, and that's at its essence. Mosul, the film, is really not a, a war movie about the, the, the liberation of Mosul. It's really about what's going to come next. Uh, and even though it takes place during the liberation of Mosul, everything is with an eye towards what's next. And you know, one thing that wasn't really at the forefront of our mind two years ago when we were in production on this was the, was the Iranian piece. 
Um, and of course, there were the Shia influenced and funded and equipped militias that we see on, on screen. But in terms of the, the, the level of seriousness that it's, it's been now raised to in our own foreign policy, the, the, the seeds of the next conflict are all represented within the film itself. Uh, and whether that be, you know, the rise of the next ISIS, uh, the situation in Syria and Turkey, um, the, the, the threat that Iran poses to the region, um, all those different com- uh, competing interests play out in, in the film itself and you hear through the different uh, characters. Yeah, it's interesting comparison. I don't think a lot of Americans or people worldwide understand the devastation that has really impacted the country of Iraq. Who has the responsibility for building that country back up? Well, there's an uncomfortable fact that, that a lot of people in D.C. are going to have to deal with, which is that without, uh, without Iran, uh, ISIS may very well still be in most. Um, so you'll see with your own eyes in the film, uh, the, the yellow Hezbollah colored flags, You'll hear them talking about payments from the Iranian government to fund the to fund the troops. Uh, Om Hanadi says that herself. So, it, you know, I, I think a lot of people that the mainstream media doesn't really get into this in, in terms of understanding, you know, how how ISIS was ultimately defeated in Mosul. Certainly, the U.S. played a role in that with uh, with our training and equipment, and and the U.S. face is really just off screen in in the film. Uh, but the Iranian role in in, in that uh, it, it can't be understated. And it's just a measure, uh, just an indicator of how, you know, how serious they finally came to take the threat. Because during the, you know, during the first couple of years after we had pulled out, uh, they weren't really interested in that part of Iraq. Uh, they didn't really have an ancestral claim to it. And they just kind of threw a line and didn't pay much attention to it. But when it became a, a real problem, they got real serious. And, and we can see that, that they had a, a very a strong impact um, in, the, in the final outcome. Why should... Americans pay for the rebuild of Iraq is and we've spent over 2.8 trillion that's with a T on this war in Iraq alone that's not even including Afghanistan uh, why why should we continue to pay for that is it because we just went in and smashed the crap out of that place and that's what our military is designed to do we break stuff up we don't build stuff so even if we take on the responsibility of saying, yes, this is an American problem, we need to, to fix what we broke, why, did, why should people subscribe to that philosophy, in your opinion? Well, I, I would start with the, with the assertion that what we broke may not be fixable. Uh, the genie may not go back in the bottle. Um, and that's kind of an apocalyptic uh, outlook, but I think a lot of people in that in the film, uh, a lot of people in that region may agree. Uh, the, the sort of the hounds of hell have been unleashed, and you know h- how they can be contained and, and shifted into something productive is is beyond my pay grade. But to your point, I think it's it's a question of sacrifice, and it's it's a double edged sword uh, because your brothers and sisters uh, fought and bled there and spent years of their lives there. To some extent, you owe it to them to not walk away from a problem that that so much has been invested into and at, on the other on the other side of the coin it's at, at what point you say you know this is this is an iraqi problem or this is a middle east problem and man that's a tough question it, yeah it's a really it's more a, that, that's not a strategy question or a political question that that's almost like a uh, an ethical type question that's really really tough but I, I can tell you what we need to do is we need to talk about it um within the military community, within the foreign policy community, uh, our politicians need to be talking about it. And there needs to be, I mean, we have the same, the same parallel question in Afghanistan, perhaps even more going on 17 years there. It, it, if there's, if there's not stuff blown up, it doesn't tend to get covered by the, the nightly news, but what's going on now in most of it's just as important as what was going on five years ago when ISIS was cutting heads off. So it, it needs to be discussed. I, I, co- I completely agree. And I think it's kind of funny you used a, a Persian analogy with the genie in the bottle thing, which uh, maybe it's uh, oil back in the well. What do we have to get? (laughs) What do we, (laughs) yeah, maybe an Arab uh, analogy, like you put the, you can't put the oil back in the well, but uh, we have gotten nothing out of that country. And I think that we are viewed as occupiers in this war and 
the, we have to make no mistake about it. There has to be something in it for us that, at the end of the day, in my opinion. And because we haven't established a presence in that region, I think it's interesting too, this this week on the news across mainstream media headlines where Trump is continuing to pull out of Iraq. Why do you think this current administration, despite the lack of narrative about the problems going on there, how we're going to fix it, was it all worth it? And now our administration is saying, we're going to keep pulling guys out. We're, we're not going to stay there. We're going to hand those problems back over to the puppet Iraqi government. What do you think about that? Well, I think it, I think they're the part of the Trump administration, and very much it's you know it's instinctual. And I, I think the feeling is enough is enough. Just what just what you said. Um, there's been enough sacrifice, and, and they're going to have to step up and, and do it themselves. Uh, and I think the the kind of the guardrails on on potentially the president's you know uh, inclinations are the establishment and foreign policy community that says, well, that's fine, but you've got to keep some troops in Syria to. To, to push the Russians back. You get to keep some troops in, on the border to do this. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think that's another internal conflict between having the instinct to know this is ridiculous. This isn't our conflict. It's not our problem, but understanding that it can be our problem. And we don't want to be back there in five years with, you know, with, with uh, Baghdad being a, a you know, a, an outpost of Iran with its nuclear arms, right? So we can deal with it then or we can deal with it now. But we have to have an honest conversation about what we're dealing with and why and what the potential ramifications are of both courses of action. Yeah, that character, Nasser, the guy, the uh, the ISIS captured, I guess you'd call him a cleric, I guess, of some kind or imam. His his doctrine of inculcating people, young men. And, and let's understand this. This is from my direct experience. When you talk to young men in Iraq, there is no hope. There is no dream. They're just like uh, inner city kids where everybody they know has been shot, killed, in jail. That's the reality for these guys. So there is nothing. So when someone comes with something, even if it's a horrible ideology, those, those young men are exploitable. So when we say, hey, we should just leave and not spend any more money, understand that all that exploitation is going to happen unchecked. And in this case, it turns into ISIS and the smashing of the second biggest city in Iraq. Not to mention all of the other problems that came out of that whole, you know, that jumping point for them. This, there was a cost to stay in, for sure, but there's also a cost to not going. And look how complex this this thing, conflict is. You know, Iran gets to be a good guy in this case in, in terms of funding, you know, the, the, the battling of Daesh. How, how they can't sort this out themselves, Dan, right? Like who is, who isn't? Who, who's just trying to survive by picking whatever side keeps them alive today? It's extraordinarily complex. How did you figure out how to tell that story even? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, the hardest part about the whole film was actually trying to figure out at, at the beginning, you know, there's, I guess, maybe seven minutes of kind of context where, where Ali is giving a, a, a narrative, a, a voice of a narrative of kind of what's happening in, in, in Mosul and in, in Iraq at that time. And, and that was actually the most difficult part of trying to tell the story because it actually it interfered with us getting to know the characters and developing kind of a, an emotional connection to them, which is really the heart of any story. So that once, once we kind of figured that out, it, it, it all kind of just followed along the river over over nine months and it just kind of went along the way. So do you think with the discussion we just kind of touched on about regional responsibility, all of the other GCC states, the regional players, and having a responsibility to help the United States rebuild the country. Was part of your intent that your film, Missoula, will bring out those conversations, not only in America, but abroad? You know, I, I suppose a lot of filmmakers start with a clear intent on who their audience is and, and what the film is going to be about and, and what the message is. And in my case, I really went into this not knowing any of the, the questions to any of those answers. Um, all, all I knew in October 2016 was that everybody literally in the world was against ISIS. Uh, and the outcome from a military standpoint of the battle was was certain. But what would happen after that or who the characters we would identify in the story would be, that that was all unknown to me. 
Uh, and one of the most interesting things, I'll get back to your point about the Allies in a second, but one of the most important things and, and really heartwarming things to me has been uh, in the process of, of marketing this and, and distributing it, going around and telling people about the film and talking about the message is finding out who really is interested in it. And no surprise, it's, it's veterans and specifically veterans who were there. And if you get on our Facebook page, you're going to see veterans from different parts of the country connecting. Oh, you were here then. I was there then. I mean, it's, it's like a, it's like a VFW reunion on the Facebook page at different posts. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, and, and to hear their, their stories after they've watched it. And, um, we had one veteran, a female veteran. She was a combat medic. Uh, she served up there. Uh, she came to one of our screenings in LA. And she just wrote this incredibly moving post about how she wasn't sure she could come to the film because, you know, she still suffers from PTSD, but uh, she lost a lot of friends there. But uh, at the same time, she wanted to know uh, what, what the future held for Mosul. And, and she, she found it, I think the word she used is therapeutic to actually watch it and to, to see that at least for a time and space uh, that the groups had come together uh, and they could all agree that ISIS was just awful and evil and abhorrent and um, they needed to take action of, of their own. You know, let me jump in on that and say, because I share time in that space too, and I spent a lot of time in that battle space outside of the camps. And I, I found the movie hard for me to watch. And that's to your credit, because you made it very real. And I, I, I found myself wondering, like, how much of the, the gunfire was added in, you know, for color and just the way the music worked. It, it put me in a dangerous spot for me, PTSD wise, because I was like, man, this is this is super triggery for me, you know, because I'm recognizing the landscape, whether I'd been to that place or not. It was all very familiar. Mosul was the first time I had a bullet whiz by my ear. You know, oh, it, it was the first time I had a bomb go off. We got mortared every day. So all of these things yep. are brought to the fore for me. But, and I absolutely did not want to watch any of the execution part of the, the film. I had to like shade my eyes from that because I just can't take it. But that, that reality is, is, is minuscule compared to the, the psychological damage that's happened for that whole community. You know, like I, if I get PTSD for being there for a relatively short amount of time, what if you're from there? I got like Johnny Walker, whose cousin is still, a, a, the, I think he's the mayor of Missoula right now. We're going to have him on the show. How, how does a community ever figure out, if I can barely watch the film and I had to watch it in pieces, and again, that's to your credit because it was fantastic, but how in the world do we start to repair these psychological wounds that are there? Yeah, well, there's there's maybe an, an answer and, and some hope in uh, in one of the, the characters in the middle of it. His name is slipping my mind, but he's a Kadir. He's his name. He's a soldier, and he's still in the middle of the fight. But and he's he's clearly already been affected uh, psychologically from what he's experienced. And he he basically explains that he he uses animals. I mean, just like we do in the U.S., like service animals. Except there, they're goats and sheep and birds. Yeah, and that. That, that calms him. It, it soothes his soul. And it's, it's really interesting to see because they don't have service animal tags on them. And they're, you know, they're not guide dogs, but they're, I mean, it's just, it's just animals that he's able to emotionally uh, and mentally connect to. And, and you can see kind of the peace and tranquility that, that it brings to him. And he, and he does a pretty good job of explaining it on camera. But yeah, the, I mean, some of the, you know, the, the two kids there that, that get interviewed towards the end, uh, I mean, they might not have been born when we were there. I'm sure they haven't. I mean, that was, it, some of these kids are eight, nine years old. So, you know, so, so there's there's a generation that's grown up knowing, I mean, that the starting point of their life might have been when you and I were in most. I mean, to, to think of that as a starting point, it's all been downhill since then. Uh, it's, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, I looked at those faces, those Iraqi faces looking back at me in the screen, and I thought, how old were they in 2004? You know, yeah, and they it's, were even alive. it's mm -hmm. their entire lives. Yeah. That they've experienced this. And when you hear the stories that come out and you know, this, this is why it's part of your film. It's, it's, it's shocking. And I don't know what the heck we could ever really do to, to repair that place. And if we even need to, but as a human, you, you want to help, you know, solve these things. So let's talk about the audience. I mean, obviously it's going to resonate with me because I was there, you were there, Scott has been, was in Ramadi, so he's there as well. But what about the folks who, you know, have no idea, you know, someone who lives on either one of the coasts, who's just like, I don't know anybody in the army, 
So I have no point of reference. And, and I, you know, I know ISIS is a thing, but I have no idea what Daesh is. Do they need to see it? Or who needs to see this thing to, to really get a hold of what you're talking about? This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Do they need to see it or who needs to see this thing to, to really get a hold of what you're talking about? Well, man, I mean, the, the easy job is, is selling it to, to guys like yourself um, and, and to pitching you on the importance of it. But right. that would be my hope is that is that that other demographic that doesn't know people in the military that live on the coast that don't really care would stop for a second, rent this, buy it, go see it and, and just sit for a second and see all the different levels of the messaging that's in there, whether it's veterans or, you know, the, the refugee crisis and, and find something that they can hold on to, you know, from different audiences that would, would screen this for, everybody has their own takeaway. You know? So for some it's veterans and PTSD, uh, for others, it's, you know, humanitarian NGO types that really are interested in the, in the, the refugee question and the, the plight of women, women taking off their burkas at the, you know, at the, at their, at their liberation and, and living in these refugee camps for others foreign policy questions of Iran's influence so there's there's a lot of different levels of the story but you, you're right I mean there's there's some people that this may not be a natural fit for and it's just a question of getting the word of mouth out uh, and, and hoping that they'll they'll stumble across it on iTunes I guess I think it's a really great testimonial Dan from veterans who may gravitate towards the stories because they live them as, as hard as it may be for some to watch them. I think there's a real testimonial because I often get asked, what's your favorite war movie or what are you reading about this week or this month as far as current history? And the, the interesting thing about this is there's also a debate. Is this history or is this current events? Because this is a war that's been going on for, you know, the better part of, you know, 15 years that we've been embroiled in this 17, you know, longer than that, 17 years uh, plus. So I think that having those testimonials from veterans is really important because I, for one, am extremely scrutinous when I see Iraq or Afghanistan war movies or trade documentary or not, if they are off even the slightest bit, I'll tune out. I won't watch it, but I watched your film back to back and was just sucked in by not just the immense storyline, but the overarching emotional journey of every single character and the, the human element, which you touched on earlier, the, the human element of this story, I think, is essential for everybody to watch, not just veterans. And I'm talking about the guy that pours my coffee at Starbucks to the guy that changes my tires to the lady that is doing fingernails and pedicures, I don't care who it is. These are the people that we need to say, watch this film. This is important. This is what's going on. If you want to get smarter about what's going on in the Middle East, Mazul, this film is an absolutely 100% accurate depiction of that. So there's no question in this. Uh, this is another testimonial to how great this film is and how impactful it was to me as a storyteller, as a veteran, as a filmmaker, I think you really nailed it. I guess my question then would be, how do you get those people that I just mentioned to really gravitate and, and tune in and buy this film? Well, I, I think it's, you know, I think the film right now is, is very likely selling very well in the military and the veterans community from the feedback we have on iTunes and, and some of the uh, metrics. So we're, we're pleased with that, but, you know, getting it into the larger audience, cracking it to Hollywood and, and, and having this, this scene as a, you know, not just a, a an independent film, but a, you know, a, a film that people in, from the LA community would watch is it's an entirely different thing. But one thing we are doing is we're launching into uh, the award season campaign uh, in just the, really the next two months. So that's going to be a really big effort we'll be undertaking and, we're going to try to get this film as much visibility as it can. And as you, as you pointed out, there's, 
there's people in New York and LA that, that are never going to see this in, unless it somehow gets nominated for, for some fancy award. Um, and maybe that's an Academy or maybe that's something less prestigious, but we're going to make an effort to, to go through the, the festival and the, the awards circuit, because that is, that is a way to, to, to get it in front of the traditional story makers that, that make 99% of the content that we see and we listen to. So yeah, that, so that's, that's one thing. So let's shift gears a little bit and, and talk to talk to everybody about the process of making this film. How long did it take you to make it? Did you compile all the footage? And, and what is that like for an independent filmmaker? For those who are listening to say, oh man, I, I want to do a film. I, I have a story to tell. How long did it take you? And what were the realistic and some of the unrealistic expectations that presented themselves to you along that process to be where you're at today moving into award season and your hopes and aspirations for the ultimate success of the film. We started filming in October, 2016 and the filming went through July, 2017. So it, it literally paralleled the entire operation to liberate Mosul from, from the very beginning of the outskirts in Shakat all the way to all the way into West Mosul, which was kind of the last holdout until victory on July, 20, uh, July 10th, 2017. So then it took about a year of editing, believe it or not, uh, in post-production. And uh, we were, you know, this was, this was not my, my main gig. So I had a day job and this was kind of something I was working on at nights and afternoons and weekends and then eventually became my day job. And then we went into post-production in terms of the audio and the sound design. I know Pete had mentioned the music is incredible. It's an original score. Uh, it's written by a composer named Fotec. He started off as a DJ in the UK and I, I met him completely randomly when I was in LA and he just did an amazing job on the score. He'll also be in Tampa this week. So he'll, he's going to be sitting in on a Q and a panel uh, with the filmmakers uh, after the, after the screening in Tampa at the Tampa theater. And then the sound design, I mean, th in my mind, and, and, and really this is the emotional parts of the film are driven by the music and the sound. And it's, it's not just the bullets, but it's also so the, the, the animal sounds, the sound of the wind, the sound of the uh, car tires, these, these things all really subconsciously, uh, build a, I guess the word is soundscape in the minds of the viewer, of the audience, uh, and it leads you to feel like you're there. It, it really does. Uh, so that that was uh, Peter Bowiak. He was our sound designer on this. Uh, he very very well may win an award uh, for the for the work that he's done. I think he did a great job. The sound, not just the underscore, but the way that you guys use the actual gunfire and just the other sounds that he puts in there. It, it's it really is award winning caliber stuff and so just on that alone we, we should watch it and i would love to have him on the show just to talk about how and, and what he does but l let me talk to my friends who are listening for a second here i want you guys to support support dan and his movie bozul-film.com go see this thing if you can't go to one of the big screenings and he's trying to get out to a lot of different cities to see it live uh, that's fine support him by by watching it on Vimeo or any other places where you can catch it, uh, at Film Mosul on Twitter, at Mosul Film on Facebook, you can get a hold of this movie and you can watch it. And here's what you're going to get in return. You're going to know more about the complexity and the challenges of a place like Iraq than the elected officials around us. I can't tell you how many times an elected official came to Iraq and never got anything other than great news and, and uh, you know, got to glad hand. and that's their job honestly but if you really want to understand what happens you really understand what, what veterans go through and i know you guys do because this is what you tell me when we when we talk this is a film that will give you reality this is what it's like uh, like i said when i watched this film i had to be careful and how i took it in because it was really it was filled with triggers for me so when you watch this know that you're watching something that's real something that displays the complexity when I write about conflict, I'm trying to write the complexity that's in Dan's film. And it's just, Dan, whether or not you win any awards, I don't have control over that. But I can tell you that you have the Pete Award for creating a real war movie, even though it's not about war. It is about human conflict, grinding humanity that makes you just shrink back and go what are we doing? We got to do better at this stuff. So uh, I want to say thank you. Encourage your fans to listen because encourage the uh, my, my friends to watch the movie because I know that they will like this and they will understand that much more about what we're all trying to figure out. 
you know, I, I can't tell how much I appreciate that. And it's just been a pleasure to speak to you guys today and your audience. Forward to meeting you one of these days in person. And uh, again, just a, a real pleasure. And, and thank you for your sacrifice and your service, both of you gentlemen. Yeah, it's our, it's, our, it's our honor, Dan. And again, for everyone listening to this episode, where's the best way they can tune in and get, and get a copy of Most Little Things? <laughs> The best, easiest way is iTunes. And, and honestly, a tip, uh, that's always the best quality for, for digital. If you're streaming something, Amazon might take me offline after saying that, but the, the quality on iTunes is literally just like it is in the, in the theater. And we will, uh, we will be having a handful of screenings around the country later, probably into the fall, um, certainly only in a handful of cities. But if you can see it live, you want to talk about the sound soundscape and, and the score, it's just amazing when you're in, when you hear it in a theater. But you know, as an independent film, it's not going to be in theaters everywhere or in theaters most anywhere. It'll be a it'll be a luxury if we can get it to your city, but we're going to try. And coming up, where should people visit to join you at one of those screeners coming up real soon? Absolutely, you can you can uh, RSVP for our event in Tampa, which is Tuesday the twenty first, or our event in Charleston, which is Wednesday the twenty second. Uh, you can go to mosul film dot com, and there's an event page there. And just sign up and look forward to seeing you. I got to convince you to come out to the Bay. We'll put you up in Benicia. Scott knows what it's like. And we got to do a screener somewhere over there because I want people to see your film, man. It's it's such an impactful thing. And, and we support small film where I'm from. And it, so it would be really great to get a chance to have you come out and show everybody your film and do a Q&A with them. Uh, I wanted to ask you, and I know we're talking about your movie right now and you're out there promoting the heck out of it, but what's what's next? Do you have a sense for what you're going to get to next? Yeah, so what I, I think what's next is, you know, there, there's already a, a follow-on that it, it kind of leaves you with a, so what's next question when you when you see Mosul. And it's it's really diving into this conflict that I think is, is taking the forefront now between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Um, and and we, we might look at it through a religious lens and, and say it's between Sunni and Shia, but I, I think it's in, in some ways more political. Um, but it's significant, and, and there, there are a handful of proxy wars going on right now uh, around the region, in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Syria, even in, to some extent in Afghanistan. Uh, and I think for the next 50 years, more than uh, Wahhabism or Salafism, it's going to be the, this Sunni-Shia uh, divide that, that's going to really drive not only the events of that region, but our foreign policy and, and where, uh, where we need to be paying attention. So... We have uh, we have some great contacts and connections in, in all of those countries, actually. And uh, I'd love to start filming as soon as the fall. When you look at the hazards of filming in places like Mosul and all the other, because it seems like you have a penchant for that. What do you, because people want to know, like, how do you safely do that? How do you, I mean, just watching the camera guy get, you know, guided, you know, like you guys had an anti-sniper tactics going on trying to get him into a humvee and everything and you know moving across the street takes planning so right how well, do look, you I, deal with I don't that wanna, i don't want to let you guys i don't let you guys um, but the last time i was in mosul was in, it was in 2005 so this was all done by my iraqi crews uh who i've known for for quite a long time uh and they were they were essentially directed uh in terms of how this was to be filmed and, and how how what i wanted to put on camera by me, but ultimately they they were embedded with the Iraqi military uh, or or Iraqi security services or the militia, and the the hard part was obviously finding the right people um, to get to get linked up with. Uh, but that that bravery and, and courage that you saw on screen is all to be attributed to the Iraqi filmmakers themselves or the Iraqi cinematographers and, and sound guys and fixers. Uh, that did that work. I, I just want to take a second to give the audience again some clarity on this because they can't know from watching that film, but this is no shit. Like when, when there's fighting going on and there's people out hiding and shooting, they are really trying to kill you. They don't care if you're a cameraman or not. So when these guys get directed, go now, go here, go there, get it. You know, it's, everything is quick. It's fast. And it's no shit as dangerous as it can be. I mean, it's, it's incredible to get that much footage and no wonder it took you a year to put that together. You must've just had so much stuff. What was left on the cutting room floor that you wish you could have shown, but you just didn't have time. 85 hours of footage and still down to, I guess an hour and uh, 20 minutes or 10 minutes, however long it was. So, so many more uh, really courageous uh, soldiers and, and militia fighters. I mean, there's, there's just so much there. There's a, we've got a lot of politicians talking that we, we cut that out. But 
I mean, that that was really the hard part of the film was figuring out which which characters to hone in on. So what we what we ultimately did was we we took the characters that we had the most intimacy with and built and built the story around them because we've got hours and hours of things going boom and uh, and bloody, gory graphic scenes, um, ISIS footage that we got. So there was uh, there was no shortage of it. Yeah, 85 hours of stuff that didn't make it into the film. Do you want to take and make a whole second cut from that stuff and tell a completely different story? Yeah, we, we probably will do a director's cut in the fall. Um, and like I said, there's there's a lot there to work with, so we, we won't have any problem there. So, I, I, yeah, I think it, I, certainly a director's cut with uh, with extra footage will be something in the works and you know, probably the fall time frame. Yeah, and, you know, there's there's a lot of bonus footage. Actually, if you, uh, I'm pretty sure that if you buy the DVD or Blu-ray, it comes with the 30-minute Nasser interview uncut, just 30 minutes of him going, talking. Uh, so that's on the DVD and Blu-ray. But the, the director's cut will have a lot more bonus footage. Oh, that's awesome. I, I mean, that's, that's exactly what people want is to get, like, just more of the real, you know? So... Hey, uh, I appreciate your time. It's, it's great having you on, being able to have this conversation. And, and just it just blows me away that we get to have these conversations that you got to make this film. It's just a fantastic thing. And as, as a guy like you that got to be there live and in person, it's, it's just you've created something that's really special. And hopefully people go out and, and support the hell out of you. And hopefully you get some awards from it because it, it's a masterpiece. And I, I just I, I thank the heck out of you for coming on the show and sharing time with Scott and I. Well, look, I, I thank you guys. And, and all the validation that I need it comes right from conversations like this with, uh, you know, just two great patriots that have been there themselves. Uh, and I didn't. I never met you over then, over there. But I, I certainly would have uh, would have loved to have been in a trench with you guys because um, just incredible bravery and Echo and Ramadi. So I, I got to put in a plug for that. And often book. I know that I know that Scott's going to make his movie next, and I'm going to write a book next. So we're going to swap. We're going to swap yeah. roles. It's all about it's all about the the tribe, man. You're part of it. So thanks again, brother. Yeah.